Hello, and thank you for being here with me today on True Crime Edition. My name's Elizabeth. Now, if you love true crimes as much as I do, then you're really at the right channel. Thank you so much for being here. Before we get to this case, we do want to extend out a heartfelt prayer to the family and friends of Tori. We are going to the beautiful Woodstock, Ontario. It's known as the dairy capital of Canada. It has a population of around 40,000 souls living there. This little soul was among them. The case of Victoria Tory Stafford. Tory Stafford was a bright eight year old. And this case started back in 2009. She was born July of 2000 to her parents, Rodney and Tara. She did have an older brother named Darren, who she looked up to. Her parents got a divorce in 2002 when she was just two years old. Her and her brother Darren lived with their mother and her family also helped out. Some would say that Tori was more like a tomboy. She did not mind getting muddy and didn't care about bugs. She loved the outdoors and of course animals. She did have an outgoing personality. She would let you know when she was there. She was known for being a little pistol from what her grandmother would say. She was very friendly to everybody who would listen to her. She would talk their ear off if you'd let her. She was very trusting. This is what many predators look for. Someone that is trusting so they can lure them into the car. And this is what happened that cold Easter weekend of April of 2009. It was on a Wednesday. Tori was at the elementary school and she went to Oliver Stevens Public School. That day, she was wearing her favorite shirt and her butterfly earrings. After school, she was to go to her dad's house and she was going to be there for a while and then go to her friend's house to watch a movie. However, those plans were not going to be fulfilled. Her dad, Rodney, was running late due to some classes that he had. Around four o'clock, he'd call Tara to let her know. The school was just a couple blocks away from Tori's home. It was a new house and they had moved into it about a week earlier. Tori had just decorated her room the night before. She put a Disney princesses, brats, and of course a high school musical. Darren, Tori's brother, after school, they had an argument like most siblings do. And little did he know that that would be the last time that he would talk to his little sister again. Normally, Darren would have walked Tori home. However, he had walked some other kids home that dreadful day. He then had went back to the school to see where she was, to look for her, and he couldn't find her anywhere. So he'd figured that she must have walked home. So he left to go back to the house. Tori's grandmother had lived with them, and when he got home, she had asked him, where was Tori? And he says, I don't know. So they had left in the car to go back to the school, and then they called Tori's friends to see if they had saw her. None hadn't. Then they had notified Tori's mother. In a panic, they had both hopped in the car to go back to look for her around the neighborhood. Tori was nowhere to be found. It was around 6 p.m. Tara had finally called Rodney to see if he happened to see her. He hadn't. Then they had called the police to report her missing. The police had come out and searched Rodney's house where he lived with his girlfriend, Petrina Fraser. There was no sign of Tori anywhere. The police had went through the whole family to see if anyone had seen Tori. None of them had. The investigators had went to the school and searched there as well, but she vanished. Normally when there is a missing child, there is no time to waste at all. 
an Amber Alert does go out. However, this is not the case for poor Tori. The authorities let her down big time. Then they did hand out flyers and notify the media. They had birds in the air looking for her everywhere. Tori's disappearance drew media attention all across the country and, of course, across the border. Tori being missing had become one of Ontario's largest investigation. Every boats, boots, and dogs were looking for her. The investigator said, quote, The ground search has not located something that would lead us to believe foul play may be a factor, unquote. As time went on, Many had got frustrated that nothing was being found regarding what had happened to Tori. Also, that there was no Amber Alert that was in effect right away as she was reported missing. Normally an Amber Alert would go out when a child comes up missing and it would be a blasted all over the radio and also the phones. This did not happen for Tori due to she did not meet the criteria. It's a high priority call. We do not have enough information at this point to support an Amber Alert. It does not meet the criteria at all, and we have no information um, with the, the three criteria it has to meet. None of those have been met, so it's not an Amber Alert at this point. Ontario Amber Alerting. There are three criteria. One, a child under 18 has to be abducted. Two, the child was in danger of serious harm. And three, there was enough description information about the child or abductor so that the media alert would be helpful. Later, this was changed due to Tori's case. Matters did not help that Tara, her mother, did not call the police when she didn't arrive home and she had waited till the late in the evening. The police had got a hold of the CCTV that was near the school when she did come up missing. This did shed a whole new light on what happened to Tori. With what they really could not see who it was with Tori and that was leading her way that they knew as an adult female, brown hair, a white jacket, Tori seems to be trusting her, not minding going with her. Tori's home life was not the best, as everyone thought it was. You see, Tara had been addicted to Oxycontin, and Tori's dad, Rodney, was really never in the picture much at all. Many started rumors of what might have happened to Tori, that maybe she was taken from a drug dealer, or that her parents had something to do with it, of her being missing. It all had spun out of control, blaming the parents and pointing fingers. I mean, quit pointing fingers at everybody else until there's somebody that we can point a finger at. The rumors are kind of never ending, aren't they? It's oh, ridiculous. for sure. Yeah. It's absolutely ridiculous. And the point of the matter is there's nobody to point a finger at, so point it at me or my family, you know, and I, I just think it's disgusting. I've heard all kinds of shit, and yeah. it's real, pardon my language, but it's really right. starting to frustrate me. People have said, you know, I don't come out here and bawl and cry in front of the cameras and carry on, and, you know, there was somebody who put their kids in their car seats and drove into a lake with their kids, and they went out there and bawled and cried and carried on, and they were the person who was responsible for it. I'm just not the kind of person that can come out here and cry for the cameras every single day. What, what are you kind of saying because I was crying and showing my emotions and stuff? Behind no, I'm not that saying that. I'm saying that's, that. that's the way I took what you just said. No, I'm saying that people get angry because I don't come out here and I can't cry in front of cameras. And so people are holding that against me and saying, that, you know, she's acting this way, so she must have something to do with it. That's just the way that I am. I can't come out here and open up for a bunch of strangers. And if people can't understand that, then. Sorry, this is making me really frustrated, Tara, because this is your daughter. It doesn't matter who should be standing in front of you. I could have the world standing here, and I would cry. I wouldn't care. Tori is missing. Do you what, think, Rodney, what, I'm not going to stay up here and fight with you about it, okay? You know what? From now on, any of these press conferences, okay? If you want to do them, continue them. I will do mine elsewhere, because, no. You are showing a total lack of support, or support for your daughter. 
You know no. what? You want to talk about a lack of support okay. for my daughter? Where the hell Keep were going. you for the last nine years? Okay. Where were you for the last? Check nine every years? one of these cameras, every one of these media, every one of those police You've officers. You've been at them now. I but have where told were you for them. The last the, nine I have told years. them everything from the beginning. Yeah, walk away like usual. Yeah. Yeah. You come back. The police did a composite sketch of the woman that they had seen with Tori that was leading her. However, nothing did come from that. Nobody did recognize her. With Tori having issues with drugs, the public had thought maybe she had something to do with Tori being missing. However, the police had kept something close to their chest. Many thought it was Tara leading her daughter away, but one person had said no, it doesn't look like her at all. It looks like Terry Lynn. So the police started to check into that. They had brought her in for questioning. Was 18 years old and she was helping to find Tori. She even handed out flyers trying to get the word out to find her. But now she's the one's being investigated on Tori's disappearance. She had then been arrested on an unrelated charges, and now she is a person of interest. Then the Ontario Prevention of Police would be leading the case on Tory and searching for her. Due to the search was not finding any clues or getting any results or where she was. The police had to come to realization two weeks after she came up missing that this was an abduction. Whether described as a missing person or an abduction, it makes no matter. The investigation is the same. They had tried to get information out of Terry Lynn. She was being tight-lipped. Now Tara, Tori's mother, had known Terry Lynn. They were just an acquaintance by drug use. They did have the same drug dealers, also methadone clinics they had been in. Terry Lynn had much troubled past. She was in a foster homes, one after another, and then she got hooked on Oxycontin. Also, there was an incident that did involve what they say, a dog and a microwave. She was really totally messed up. Still nothing came to anything until he walks in. It was her boyfriend named Michael Rafferty. He is 28 years old and he had come to visit her in jail. You see, Michael and Terry Lynn have been dating for about four months or so. Michael did not have a criminal past nor a police record. He was good at making sure that he covered his tracks and would not get caught like child porn. When it did come to a woman, he would pimp them out for money. He was also of Plenty of Fish, the dating website. He would woo the girls like a lion. He would tell them many stories to women that he dated, what he did, where he worked, and to a point that he had bought his mother a house. Depending on the woman, he would even tell her that he had cancer and he was dying. He really laid it on thick and very believable. This is one fish to stay away from. Some friends would say that he was unemployed most of the time, but occasionally he did do landscaping. Now, as he was there visiting Terry Lynn, he, they had police had asked him to come in so they could interview him, and he said, all right. He had told them they were not nothing serious or in a serious relationship at all. They were just friends, and he really wanted to be cooperative and to help them, so he did. Would you consider your girlfriend or my girlfriend? Yeah. No. 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 Like, is there any, has there been anything between you and Terry Lynn uh, yeah, intimately at all? We're friends. Just friends. Okay. So, do you watch the video? Yeah. It's on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Did, did you? What did you think watching that video? Okay. Can you recognize anyone at all? Uh, no, I didn't recognize anyone. You know. Have you ever observed uh, Terry Lynn wearing any type of uh, certain jackets at all? White jackets? Uh, 
I've seen her, like, she has a long, dressy white one, I think. Yep. And she has a long, dressy black one. Yep. Those are the only two coats that I know. Like, one, they sway in the wind as she walks. Do you recall around the, the 8th of uh, April, then, um, what you were doing that day? That Wednesday? I don't know what I was doing. I mean, I, most of the time I was just in zipping around town or something. Or, It was not until May 24th of 2009. I'm not sure if it was guilt or what, but Terry Lynn could not take it any longer. She wanted to talk to the investigators. This is what she had told them what had happened. She thinks she is fooling them by crying. I'm not sure if she was really aware that they're being recorded due to her actions when the investigator left to get her some tissues, and then he came back. I could hear, I could hear her. I see on the ground, I turned and away again. I could hear her, like, the sound, the sound of her voice, like, just grow fainter. From what she had told them, that they had planned on what they were wanting to do that day, that they had planned out, and they discussed it thoroughly. Like, for previous to the, the day of the event, was like saying, oh, would you ever, you know, would you ever kidnap somebody? Well, we went through a whole thing where oh, you're, you're just talk. You never do it. You just talk. You can do. You're gonna do that today. You're gonna do that today. He uh, had made the comment about young female. So it'd be easy to manipulate. Victoria was the was the first um, young like younger female that came out. If I knew like what the, what the outcome of that would have been, I never would have. They had made up their minds that they were going to get Tori because Tori had known Terry Lynn. She would be happy and so easy to get into the car. She did tell her that she had a puppy. As she got closer to the car, Terry Lynn had pushed her in the back of the car and they drove off. As they drove northeast, they had stopped to get some pills and gas and of course coffee. Then the next stop was at Home Depot. Michael was staying with Tori in the car while Terry Lynn went to buy a claw hammer and garbage bags. He wanted, he wanted a claw hammer and garbage bag. Garbage bags, like a box of garbage bags. It's really contemplating like, whether or not I wanted to go back up to the vehicle or not. Um, my biggest reason for even going back to the vehicle was because Tori was there, and I knew at least while I was there, I could, I could, I could at least make it somewhat better for her. Then you can see her putting the stuff in the trunk, and then get back in the car, and they drove off to do the unthinkable to Tori. It seemed like you kick her up with the hips, like... <laughs> Garbage bag over her head. Where did he hit her with the hammer? The head. We need to. We need to bring her home. I know that. That's why. I've, that's why I've been here. Like I'm not. Tori was left at that spot. Put rocks over her. Like. Anything else you're holding back? Because we might as well get it done now. We got the tears going. Everything's happening now. I don't want to have to put you through this again. I don't want to. Is there anything else? When I go away and I evaluate everything that's happened today, and I start looking at it with with the uh, the experts that are going to have, help me assess your credibility, am I going to have to come back and say, Terry, there's something that's missing here? No. If everything had thrown everything out, like everything that had laid it all out, that's, that's the 
drove. Terry Lynn had told them everything. She wanted them to know about what had happened. The outcome, no one had wanted to know that Tori was dead by the hands of these two. Then the police had arrested and got Michael. He was living with his mother, and he was also under the radar when they brought him in. Uh, as I told you, my name is uh, uh, Chris. My last name was Lowell. I understand your name is Michael. Are you my Mike or Michael? What's your preference? Okay, well, I'll probably call you Mike. So unless that really offends you, um, just uh, uh, leave it with me. And we're talking about the, uh, the missing person one, uh, Tory Staff went missing. I know you were following a little bit in the media, and you follow some little bits and pieces of those behavioral sciences people involved, right? And I know it's a pretty good feeling to be involved in something like this, and the police don't come near you for over a month, right? The police don't talk to you till May 15th. It's the first time that uh, they come around. So you were feeling pretty comfortable for a little while, okay? You're completely under the radar. I'm going to um, assess risk here and see, number one, do you even feel bad about what you've done? That's the first thing I look for. And number two, do I think, okay, he doesn't feel bad, so an attorney's probably going to do this again because he really doesn't care about it the first time it's happened, okay? I okay. didn't do anything. Well, that's not entirely true. Yeah, that is okay. entirely true. I, no. I didn't do anything. No, you can try and cement yourself into that, okay? But at the same time, you're not doing yourself any good by not being truthful. You do not do what you think no, I did. I know you did. We're past that. Okay? No. We're past that. Thing. <laughs> okay. You're doing mm -hmm. things I didn't do so I so I can get locked up for the rest of my life for this. What's your biggest fear or your biggest concern now that you've been charged with this? What's your biggest concern here? Losing my life. Okay. It means losing my life. It means not being able to have a life anymore. Losing his life? Really? What about the life of Tori? The one that he raped and killed? It means not taking care of my mom. It means not having to do the things that I do every day. The police had done everything in their power to get him to confess. With no luck, he kept denying everything, saying that Terry Lynn was a liar. Terry Lynn was asked today if she wanted to call Laura four times. She said no, all four times. She went through two boxes of Kleenex. All right? She says on the 8th of April, Wednesday, the 8th of April, 2009, at 3.30 in the afternoon, you drop her off at Pavey, south of Fife, south of the public school. Tori walks out of you tell her to get a girl and you want her young. She walks up the street, you drive up to the old age home where you park your car. She walks up to Tori. Tori is nice to her. She trusts her. She holds her hand for a little bit. She walks up the street with her. Terry Lynn tells her about her little dog, gets her across the street to your car, opens the back door. Tori doesn't like it anymore. She pushes you in the car. You start driving. She said she's freaking out. She said she's worried about you. She's scared about what you're going to do. And you pull into a farmer's field, right across from a house, to the point where you're even asking her if anybody can see you. She says she goes for a walk. Because she doesn't want to see what happens. And then she comes back. And you're not sitting in the front seat anymore, Mike. You're sitting in the back seat. And she's not liking what she sees. So she walks away again. Then she comes back, and you make her hold one of those garbage bags while you put some of your clothes, her jacket, and a hammer in the garbage bag. Then you drive to a gas station. She never sees Tori again. Tori gets wired. Let's have some. This is your opportunity, Terry. Let's sit right here and tell her she's a liar. Problem I say it without over the room. Terry's a liar. Yeah. That's what you're hoping. No, you're not. I don't need to. Now, Terry Lynn was trying to remember where they had put Tori's body. She drew them a map to where she thought she was buried. They even had cadaver dogs out. Police were looking everywhere with no luck. 
Then on June 20th, a detective, who was the one that did interview Terry Lynn, Detective Sergeant Jim Smith, he had a hunch as he looked at the map. And he went out to look somewhere else that was kind of near where the map had been drawn in hopes to find Tori's body. And sadly, he did. He found Tori, and she was dead. She was just like Terry Lynn had described, wrapped up in plastic, and she had been buried under rocks. Her decomposed body was found 103 days later, just a Hannah Montana t-shirt with the words, a girl can dream. You see, she loved Hannah Montana. She was finally brought home and they did the autopsy on Tori. What the examiner had said, numerous rib fractures suggesting strong force had been applied to her chest, possibly by kicking or stomping. Examinations of the lung tissue had showed evidence of liver damage, which must have occurred while Tori was still alive and not from the rock that was later been found and piled on her torso. The hammer blows to the head she received, at least four, had penetrated into the skull. She could not survive that. However, the liver damage might have occurred after the hammer blows while Tori was still alive. What they put that little girl through, no one could imagine. The pain that she must have felt before she died. Those human remains uh, have now been removed and are on their way to the Center of Forensic Sciences where forensic identification examination will be conducted. And we are hopeful that those are in fact the remains of Victoria Stafford. Then in 2010 in April, that Terry Lynn had pleaded guilty to first degree murder. Then she was sentenced to life in prison with no parole for 25 years. Everybody back off this band right now. Back off. Back off. off the band now. Come on, guys. I told you five up. feet, didn't I? Many were outraged and wanted a piece of him. Michael's trial had begun in March of 2012, and Terry Lynn was to testify. Then there was a wrench thrown into the pot of court stew. Terry Lynn had taken the stand, but however, her story had just changed that Michael had raped Tori, but Terry Lynn had killed her with the hammer. No one knows the truth of who killed Tori with that hammer, but she did take the responsibility for doing it. Clintic admitted she was the only one who hit the girl with the hammer. And help me assess your credibility. Am I gonna have to come back and say, Terry, there's something that's missing here? As soon as Terry Lynn had said this, the defense heard it and said that Michael all along has said he was innocent and this proves it. Now there was a two month long trial on May 15th of 2012, no one fell for what Terry Lynn had stated when she was on the stand saying she did it. He was sentenced to life in prison with no parole for 25 years also. Michael had appealed immediately, claiming that the judge instructions to the jury were flawed. He had made many appeals, and the latest was in 2016. It was immediately dismissed. Even in prison, sadly, Michael's actions had taken two other lives. Michael had been having his mother pay for his protection in prison, saying that he will get beat up if he doesn't pay the inmates. So she had been arranging, putting money on his books, over $30,000. She also paid their spouses also. With the stress of it all, she did have a heart attack in August of 2018. She had lost her home, then she passed away at the age of 60. He later was accused by the family extorting her own mother. Now Michael had been transferred in 2018 to a minimum security and this did outrage the family of 
Tori, who is trying to get Michael back in maximum security. Then the family got an unexpected ally, none other than Michael's own family, who wants to remain anonymous, of course, is trying to help the family get Michael back into maximum security. Michael's family member has been submitted proof of checks, which was done by his mother. The family member repeatedly had asked the Correctional Service of Canada to stop the calls, but it still continued. Now, once Michael's mother was unable to pay his finances to him, he started approaching his grandmother to do that. Michael's grandmother passed away shortly after he contacted her to take over for paying for him. The family of Michael has said they totally blame him for both of their deaths. As for Michael Rafferty, he is still incarcerated in La Macasa Institution, a secure correctional facility that does specialize in dealing with sex offenders. It is fully surrounded by guarded double fence, equipped with advanced security systems, both physical and electronic. Tori's family, and even Michael's family, will continue to fight to have him move back to where he belongs. Then there's good old Terry Lynn. It was in 2018 she was moved to a healing lodge in Saskatchewan. She claimed she was indigenous. Now, anyone could claim that, that they're indigenous, with even no proof at all. Indigenous offenders do come to these healing lodges, but they have to be committed to indigenous programming and spirituality. She would stay there with her beliefs and not be in maximum security. She was first classified to. A lot of people are upset about what has happened. And you can see probably behind me a lot of purple. That was Tori Stafford's favorite color and really has become a symbol for people here. Earlier, they were chanting, send her back. But each time I walk past one of you guys and you guys give me support, give me that much more strength to stand here and do what I want to do. And that's to stand up for my daughter. Clearly, what's required is a firm and immediate directive from the minister to Corrections Canada to put McClintic back behind bars where she belongs. She had attacked another inmate even. With all the immediate attention and protesting, she was sent back to regular prison behind bars to do the rest of her time. However, she would be eligible for release after serving just 15 because she pleaded guilty and was sentenced in 2010 prior to the elimination of what is known as the Faint Hope Clause. Michael was sentenced after the elimination of the Faint Hope Clause. This means his sentence of life with no chance of parole for 25 years stands as is. As for the family of Tori, they all have been through so much with the loss of Tori. Her death tore them apart even further than it was. Without Tori in their lives, they will forever be a huge hole in the family. She was loved by them all very much, and they miss her terribly. They will continue to remember her for who she was and keep her memories alive. Now when her body was found, all she had on was a Hannah Montana t-shirt that said, a girl can dream. Only her dream didn't come true. This is for, it for today's case. Thank you so much for being here with me. I truly appreciate you. I'll be on another case. Until then, see you on the next one.